first, a video. Yes, it is a scrambled egg. But as you look at it, I hope you'll begin to feel just slightly uneasy. Because you may notice that what's actually happening is that the egg is unscrambling itself. And you'll now see the yolk and the white have separated, and now they're going to be poured back into the egg. And we all know in our heart of hearts that this is not the way the universe works. A scrambled egg is mush, tasty mush, but it's mush. An egg is a beautiful, sophisticated thing that can create even more sophisticated things, such as chickens. And we know in our heart of hearts that the universe does not travel from mush to complexity. In, in fact, this gut instinct is reflected in one of the most fundamental laws of physics, the second law of thermodynamics, or the law of entropy. What that says, basically, is that the general tendency of the universe is to move from order and structure to lack of order, lack of structure, in fact, to mush. And that's why that video feels a bit strange. And yet, look around us. What we see around us is staggering complexity. Eric Beinhocker estimates that in New York City alone, there are some 10 billion SKUs or distinct commodities being traded. That's hundreds of times as many species as there are on Earth. And they're being traded by a species of almost 7 billion individuals who are linked by trade, travel, and the Internet into a global system of stupendous complexity. So here's a great puzzle. In a universe ruled by the second law of thermodynamics, how is it possible to generate the sort of complexity I've described, the sort of complexity represented by you and me and the convention center. Well, the answer seems to be the universe can create complexity, but with great difficulty. In pockets, there appear what my colleague Fred Spear calls Goldilocks conditions, not too hot, not too cold, just right for the creation of complexity. And slightly more complex things appear. And where you have slightly more complex things, you can get slightly more complex things. And in this way, complexity builds stage by stage. Each stage is magical because it creates the impression of something utterly new, appearing almost out of nowhere in the universe. We refer in big history to these moments as threshold moments. And at each threshold, the going gets tougher. The complex things get more fragile, more vulnerable. The Goldilocks conditions get more stringent. And it's more difficult to create complexity. Now, we as extremely complex creatures desperately need to know this story of how the universe creates complexity despite the second law and why complexity means vulnerability and fragility. And that's the story that we tell in big history. But to do it, you have to do something that may at first sight seem completely impossible. You have to survey the whole history of the universe. So let's do it. <laughs> let's begin by winding the timeline back 13.7 billion years to the beginning of time. Around us, there's nothing. There's not even time or space. Imagine the darkest, emptiest thing you can and cube it a gazillion times, and that's where we are. And then suddenly, bam, a universe appears, an entire universe, and we've crossed our first threshold. The universe is tiny, it's smaller than an atom, it's incredibly hot, it contains everything that's in today's universe, so you can imagine, it's busting. And it's expanding at incredible speed. And at first, it's just a blur. But very quickly, distinct things begin to appear in that blur. <clears throat> Within the first second, energy itself shatters into distinct forces, including electromagnetism and gravity. And energy does something else quite magical. It congeals to form matter. Quarks that will create protons and leptons that include electrons. And all of that happens in the first second. Now we move forward 380,000 years 
That's twice as long as humans have been on this planet. And now simple atoms appear of hydrogen and helium. Now, I want to pause for a moment, 380,000 years after the origins of the universe, because we actually know quite a lot about the universe at this stage. We know, above all, that it was extremely simple. It consisted of huge clouds of hydrogen and helium atoms, and they have no structure. They're, they're really a sort of cosmic mush. But that's not completely true. Recent studies by satellites such as the WMAP satellite have shown that, in fact, there are just tiny differences in that background. What you see here, the blue areas are about a thousandth of a degree cooler than the red areas. These are tiny differences, but it was enough for the universe to move on to the next stage of building complexity, and this is how it works. Gravity is more powerful where there's more stuff. So where you get slightly denser areas, gravity starts compacting clouds of hydrogen and helium atoms. So we can imagine the early universe breaking up into a billion clouds. And each cloud is compacted, gravity gets more powerful as density increases, the temperature begins to rise at the center of each cloud, and then at the center of each cloud the temperature crosses the threshold temperature of 10 million degrees, Protons start to fuse, there's a huge release of energy, and bam, we have our first stars. From about 200 million years after the Big Bang, stars begin to appear all through the universe, billions of them. And the universe is now significantly more interesting and more complex. Stars will create the Goldilocks conditions for crossing two new thresholds. When very large stars die, they create temperatures so high that protons begin to fuse in all sorts of exotic combinations to form all the elements of the periodic table. If, like me, you're wearing a gold ring, it was forged in a supernova explosion. So now the universe is chemically more complex. And in a chemically more complex universe, it's possible.